A very happy new year to everyone. On behalf of the Bangalore International Center and the Bangalore Literature Festival, a very warm welcome to World Lit. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, World Lit is the Bangalore Literature Festival's digital literary platform, bringing to you live stream sessions, video interviews, and podcasts with leading international and Indian authors. Today, we're thrilled to be bringing to you what promises to be a very exciting conversation. This is also our first conversation for uh, 2021. So uh, join me in welcoming uh, you to this today's session, The Impeccable Integrity of Ruby R, author Mohan Mohsin in conversation with Namita Devi Dayal. We will be posting the full bios of the speakers on the chat box. Do post your questions in the Q&A section. With that, welcome everyone and over to you, Namita. Thank you. I am so delighted to welcome Moni. Um, I've been a huge fan of her work over the years. And above all, she just makes me laugh when I, when I scroll her Instagram. Um, I, I cannot tell you how much I loved this book, Moni. I read it in, in two sittings and it just really moved me because I found that the way in which, maybe I can start with a short summary of the book for all of, all of our uh, viewers. Um, so essentially the book- Amita, uh, don't give away too much though. Okay, okay, only thoda thoda. Thoda thoda. Thoda thoda. Very briefly, the book is the story of a young um, girl called Ruby Rauf. Uh, she's 23 years old. She's studying in London. She happens to um, go and listen to a lecture by a presidential candidate called Saif Haq, who uh, and then somehow manages to sort of enter their little um, coterie and gets quite swept away by his charisma and through a series of events ends up working for him as his social media um, in charge and moves back to Lahore for that. And then I'm not going to tell you what happens because it's just a kind of a rapid series of events that take us hurtling into young Ruby and much older Seth's life. Now, for me, why I is because, you know, it touches on so many things, but in such a kind of a easy way that you don't even know that these big issues are talked about. It's about well, quality, it's ocean politics, which has its own very specific, um, you know, musty and madness. Um, it's about gender, very much. It's about class and embedded feudalism. Um, it's about larger issues of like, you know, vulnerability and um, deceit and, you know, big sort of epic issues like that. B but above all else, this book is a really tender coming of age book about uh, a young girl. And to me, I think that's what really above all touched me. And so I love the way, Moni, you've sort of braided together these larger, you know, disturbing issues, but in a, in your sort of inimitable satirical way. But there's also this real sort of tender story about this young girl. And my first question to you is, um, well, how did you think of writing about um, a book on the content of a 23 year old? What was the process and why did you do this and also, how do you get into the mind of somebody who is so sort of um, naive yet manipulative? I mean, I could really relate to bits of her in my young days, hopefully not anymore, but I, I likely. So Namita, thank you very, very much for your generous introduction. And I would like to start by wishing you a very happy new year. And I hope that 2021 is going to be significantly better than 2020 for a host uh, of reasons. <laughs> um, with regard yes. to this book, um, I agree with, uh, with much of what you have said. Uh, in fact, with everything that you have said, um, 
it is a, I suppose, a coming of age story because it is uh, about Ruby's growth um, and her realization of what the world is really about and her place in it. Um, but I think for me, uh, the book is, you asked me what prompted me to write this book and how I went about it. Um, there were two or three things that got me thinking along these lines and then uh, it changed as well as I was going through it. Um, first of all, the first thing that got me thinking was the Harvey Weinstein scandal when it broke. Um, and I was watching tele the, uh, the TV and sitting in London and I was listening to this and I was listening to the testimony of these young women you know, who came out and said how they had been exploited and abused by him. And I thought, and he's a very powerful figure uh, uh, and he had the power of life and death over them, all, all of their careers, of professional life and death over them. And I was thinking to myself about this and I thought if such a thing happened in Pakistan, how would it unfold? What would happen? Would anybody talk about it? Would anybody, would anybody support the women who came out? Would there be justice? Would there be accountability? Um, and then, you know, I began thinking of our patriarchy, you know, and, and how it, it uses young women to further itself, to exploit them, et cetera. And um, I thought that, you know, unlike Bollywood, the Pakistan film industry is, is, has been um, eviscerated, uh, was eviscerated by General Zia. Um, it was uh, um, targeted and destroyed. Um, and only now it's slowly sort of, you know, uh, coming back to life. Um, so it wouldn't be there because the film industry does not um, exert such a big pull on people's imagination in Pakistan. So uh, I was thinking, you know, where could such a scandal take place and what would be the repercussions? And uh, another place where women obviously are, uh, are abused and exploited a lot is the modeling industry, where very young women are manipulated. Um, but then I thought, you know, modeling is not such, and it's too niche in Pakistan. So I thought to myself that it had to be in politics. Um, that was the only place in which I could really locate this story and tell it. Um, and once I began thinking of politics, I began thinking of populism. Because, you know, after 2016, and with the election of Trump, things have kind of, you know, um, um, progressed with such rapidity that what seemed absolutely impossible and and extraordinary, uh, 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 unbelievable four or five years ago has now become the norm. Mm -hmm. um, and I began thinking, and once I began thinking along those lines, I started thinking of this kind of strong man complex that we have, uh, and that is is playing out in the subcontinent as well as as you know as our politics is is developing, um, and this idea that one strong man will solve all your problems. All you have to do is trust in him and his judgment, and you can't ask him any questions. You can't hold him to account, um, and and this kind of um, this sort of toxic uh, uh, masculinity that goes along with it. Um, you see it with Putin, you see it with Trump, you see it with uh, Boris Johnson in his own way, you see it with Imran Khan, you see it with Modi, you see it with, um, um, you know, that guy in, in Hungary, you see it in the Philippines, you see it all over the world. It's kind of, and you see it with um, uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, you know. Um, and I began thinking along those lines and thinking uh, that I wanted to write about that. Yeah. Uh, and there's this idea of, of this hyper-masculinity um, and how it, it um, um, affects uh, or normal, ordinary people's lives. But I also wanted to write a story about betrayal. And I wanted to write a story about um, not just a uh, 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 strong man, et cetera, but I wanted to write a story about ordinary people yeah. and how uh, everyday ordinary people get sucked up into this kind of narrative and how in doing so, they betray their countries, they betray their societies, they betray their friends, and most of all, they betray themselves. They betray their principles, they betray yeah. their, their values, they betray their ideology and everything that they stood for. Um, I see it all the time on Twitter, people I knew very well, or I know, I thought I knew very well, who have become so vicious and so very, um, um, you know, kind of one-sided in the way they look at the world. Um, and I wanted to talk about those things. So this book was a way of me uh, getting into that. 
Wonderful, because it really comes through, and this idea of betrayal and deceit is was the overriding sort of emotion that I think runs through the book, and it's a very personal story, actually. Um, what I really liked uh, about the way you handled the villainy and the victim dichotomy was mm -hmm. that it wasn't entirely uh, straightforward. And mm -hmm. I really like that because um, this young girl who does get caught in the snare always has that little way out. She has the options and she chooses you know, to exercise this one, um, which is pointed out to her by various other players who are almost like her voices of conscience in the mm -hmm. form of her friends or even, you know, the other gentlemen working in the party. And, you know, so there's, there's, there's this sort of interesting play on, as a reader, I felt constantly, um, you know, waiting for her to not end up in a train wreck, uh, as a train wreck. But, you know, there was always that little moment where you thought that, okay, maybe, maybe, because being a mature reader and perhaps an older woman, you knew where this was headed. And, um, you know, all times, one of us sort of experienced those fake um, messages from a man attempting to seduce, etc. And so it was all very familiar and really kind of depressing because it's almost as if like the more things change, the more they stay the same. You know, this is something that's just been there. But... Um, I liked the way you made her um, somebody who had a journey. And, you know, the girl was um, almost uh, foolishly, uh, I, I wouldn't call her entirely naive because that aggressive ambition was also playing into her, um, into her sort of catapulting into this horror show with this man. And, um, and then, of course, that final, you know, I'm not going to go into all that, perhaps. But no, please. <laughs> yeah. No, I won't. Um, although there isn't really, there's no spoiler here because it's like fairly kind of evident what is going to happen, Vagera. But yes and no, because, you know, Namita, the thing is that she's never a victim, right? Yeah. She is not a victim in, in, in I, I wanted her to be naive and yeah. yet not a victim. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was always the power dynamic. She was the one who didn't have the power in the relationship, right? But yeah. at the same time, she did have an option, which she chose not to exercise. Yeah. And I had to do that. I had to, that was something I was very careful about because yeah. I didn't want to come as a victim, to appear as a victim because then there is no, then there is nothing to root for, you know? Yes. Uh, so uh, nothing to play for. There's nothing, uh, I mean, there's something at stake, but it's almost a foregone conclusion. Yeah, but yeah. I wanted, I wanted her. I wanted other women as well to be in the frame, the, who make different decisions. Exactly, and I to love that. that. That there is an option to make a different decision. In fact, but sometimes, uh, sometimes you are so caught up. And the other thing that I wanted to talk about in this book was about a sense of grievance. You know how this sense of grievance, which is sometimes so personal in people's lives, is used to magnify, uh, to become kind of a political force. You know, so how uh, people like Trump and the Brexiteers have used this sense of grievance. I don't know how the, the EU yeah, is yeah. supposed to have uh, victimized the, uh, the, the UK, but there is a great feeling of victimization in, within, within the UK. Yes, and I don't yes. understand where it's come from, but it has been fostered. It has been grown. It has been allowed to blossom. Yeah. Uh, and the same in, in America and same in Pakistan. You know, there is this feeling that, that somehow we have been shortchanged. And this girl, because and when I talk to people, you know, about politics in Pakistan, a lot of the people who are so um, vociferous in their, their hatred or, or whatever, it usually comes because I find out that it's because of some kind of personal reason. Wow. They're, they're taking something really, something which is actually a political social issue. They've made it into a personal thing. Huh. You know? Um, and in Ruby's case, um, it is very personal. 
it uh, you know and how she the reason why she decides to take the the path that she does comes from a personal feeling of grievance a feeling of of that you know somebody somewhere owes me you know somebody along the way has i i have been dealt with unfairly you know and i now want my i want to make myself safe and i want my slice of the action something that i am owed yeah although i think that there were so many signs where um she knew that she was being lied to by the party that i wonder what was i think it was a, probably a bunch of different things on the way which made her doubt um you know namita i think once you have embarked on a certain path no matter how much people point out to you the opposite you do not listen to it it's not about rationality it's about emotion at the end of the day oh, especially you know, when yeah and and you, all these people that you see you know like there's so many people in britain who've been pointing out what an economic disaster um the uh, uh, brexit right. will be yeah you know and specialists have been pointing out and michael gove's reaction was we've had enough of specialists hmm we will do what we want this is about sovereignty this is about it's about emotion at the end of the day yeah yeah and, and there's so many scientists who can come out and tell you that that covid is not flu covid covid is something different but people will not believe it because they don't want to believe it it's about emotion you know mm. you are somehow or the other that you are being lied to or that somebody is being making a fool out of you and yeah. you know better, and you know i will have my freedom and i will have you know so you you know in america people say that i will not wear a mask because it is against my rights as a as as a free liberal as a free american right at the same time they will deny women the right to have an abortion because they do not have that freedom yeah right so i mean that's all contradictory but at the same time it makes sense to them because it's about emotion of course and it's irrational um yeah. so the the point that she was sort of um i think clutching on to was the whole sort of new um anti feudal energy that was that this man was um purportedly bringing in and i wanted you to talk a little bit <coughs> about class in pakistan um because that's handled so beautifully in the book <coughs> excuse me where you talk about how you know the lower the lower classes like nasibo uh, are able to just bear their you know almost like chati phad ke as they do you know which means like sort of be chest beating um uh, in a way that they, they're not ashamed of their horror and their pain and their wife beating and their um deep poverty and and similarly you have the upper class <coughs> excuse me which is completely sort of in that lovely fog of insouciance just carrying on and the bubble in the bubble and it's such a beautiful scene um the the one in the in which the party takes place and everyone's like doing their lines of cocaine etc it's just so plausible but what i found really lovely and poignant was that whole sort of like large spectrum of what we call middle class which is not the same as what american middle class is but it's where ruby falls and that category of people who are just stuck mm-hmm. like her you know the mother giving tuitions to entitled annoying bratty rich children and her sort of being ashamed of her clothes and not having that finesse and not perhaps ever being able to get it because it's just very hard to you know acquire you have to really sort of either be born into it in these societies mm-hmm. so i wanted to talk about that in pakistan but there were also very nice openings where people were coming out of that through their work you know whether it was essentially farah but mm-hmm. um, you know so if you can talk about this whole because i think it's even more embedded in pakistan than in india is from whatever a little bit i i know and can see right um so this whole class well, i would like to start off by pointing you know you said that he's anti feudalism hmm. um i wanted to start by talking about the hypocrisy you know that they say yeah. that they're anti feudal but the, his greatest friend and his greatest supporter and the guy oh. who he uh, you know who writes his checks etc is a a uh, feudal 
right? Um, and and he you know goes to have you know hunting on his estates and stuff like that. So yes. I wanted to talk first of all about the, the the hypocrisy, the entrenched hypocrisy. Yeah. How just because you say certain things, uh, uh, you are absolved of any responsibility. Yeah. to account for your actions so you don't have to you don't have to walk the talk as long as you're just doing the talk because people are only interested in hearing you know the things that they want to hear which make them feel better about themselves yeah um with regard to the spectrum of of uh, uh in, in class and entitlement etc um you know the poor i have always thought in the whole of the subcontinent not just in pakistan but in india and in, in sri lanka and in uh, uh, bangladesh you know i've always wondered why isn't there a revolution why don't they rise up it's because people uh, have the sense of fatalism in the subcontinent yeah. you know and and therefore um, and 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 it's found most of all in in the very poor people yeah you know because and they believe that uh there will be justice somewhere along the line at some point right and and in this life maybe they will not get it in this life and that is what keeps them kind of going but they will get it someday and and also because i think they feel uh quite rightly that the system is stacked so heavily against them that yeah. they can't even uh you know uh they they don't need to feel the kind of shame and embarrassment that ruby feels Yeah. Because Ruby's on the on the on the um, on the fringes of 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 entitlement, Ruby sees it every day. Ruby yeah. is within touching distance of it. Ruby also had a little bit of it when her dad was alive. Yeah. So you want to get back onto that. Um, and yes, the middle classes. There is a, a you know I have seen a huge growth in middle class in my lifetime. Yeah. Uh, when I was much younger, they used to be the very wealthy and the, and the poor. and there was nothing in between now of course there is a much much greater um um a population of people who are educated who are uh, aspirational who want to send their kids children to english medium schools to private yeah. schools who who will do anything it takes to get their kids uh, a decent education because they feel that that is the path to um prosperity um yeah. the english language they feel is an important um uh, skill to have um and uh, of course they send so many of their children etc abroad to uh, to work so that they can send home money so that the white daughters can be married into better families so that you know that whole sort of and and that is has been growing in pakistan and also i think with with uh, technological um advances uh, people feel that they have a voice now which they didn't have before yeah um, and, and i think that is across the board everywhere um and uh, i think that uh, leaders like this enable people certainly in pakistan i've seen over the last four years the discourse has become so coarse you know it has become so violent and so um and and people feel a sense of power almost that they can now say anything they want to you know and 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 are on on twitter etc you can it allows you to say whatever you want to and that's something i touch upon in the book as well yeah you do and that and that it you can you can you feel so you know so big in your sitting in your own home typing away and telling people who've done accomplished so much more than you have uh or, or who are so much more um powerful uh, not even just powerful but people who actually have worked for everything that they've got yeah yeah and, yeah and just telling them you know like that teacher just telling how who you know who are you to say this i i will you know i can do this to you or i can do that to you i can make these threats to you or whatever yeah um and and i wanted to talk about social media because i think it's a force for good yeah. uh, but at the same time it's also i think you guys have your trolls as well Oh uh, my god yeah i really and, want you to talk about the social media because that's a kind of a underlying narrative of its own in the book you know it's like there's yeah. a whole thread which is based entirely on the social media um inputting and trolling and manipulating and all that that happens and of course that last telling bit in the end which is also that yes. you know yeah yes. but yes. but uh, yeah i'd like you to talk about that both in both in the context of what you were saying just now which is that kind of democratic um well for democratic uh, ability to kind of change or 
empower and also the frighteningly um powerful medium it has become in this in in politics which we've seen in india and i'm i'm sure it exists in pakistan as well and it's something just unbelievable i, I mean really and it is used particularly as a as a way of silencing women wow you know um and it is being used as as a tool of the patriarchy so when i talk about you know this this kind of um alpha male syndrome the the uh, women are also very harsh and very um um what's the word um mean i i would say and 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 unpleasant on social media but they don't give out the kind of threats that men do you know to yeah. women speak up or who anything a woman wants to say can be uh, shut down by a man who yeah. threatens, uh, uh, social uh, and sexual violence as well you know yeah. and it's not just confined to india and pakistan like the guardian newspaper ran a um uh um a kind of investigation into who uh, a study into who gets trolled the most and they discover among their uh, uh, opinion writers okay and they discovered it was women and women of color in particular my god you know they get it the worst because in a patriarchy or even in in you know in in a um, misogyny works in a way that it gets men get um um feel threatened when a woman speaks sure right so in this sense uh ruby is both a um an enabler and yeah. a victim in the yeah. end, a victim yeah. as well you know and uh she i like that moral arc of what you did with her because it's almost as if she you know created the monster that eventually um, yeah what goes around comes around right yeah 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 so um it that that's something i wanted to um, you know in the beginning i had another story i'd let her i at another ending i'd let i had had a happier ending and then i thought to myself that this doesn't it's not right it doesn't make sense and that for me certainly it was very important that there should be some accountability in life you know um, um, you have to you have you know what goes around comes around to you as well what you put yeah. out is back to you as well yeah which i which i really liked because there was you could see that where the book ended the soul searching was beginning and it was lovely yeah. because at least you mm-hmm. left her with that um uh, that sense of um growth yeah and, and i that- also wanted to show how pow- the powerful are not called to account ever yeah yeah oh my god yeah you know it's only the foot soldiers it's only the foot soldiers never the generals really really um that's so true actually i didn't think of that yeah oof it's very poignant actually because it's all every bit of it is so plausible i mean yeah. book it could really have been uh put into any context of uh, when you take out the frills of the details um of you know the location and where you located it which you know in the hall or whatever it could have been in los angeles it could have been in mumbai it's it's just this very that's what i loved about it, it had this very universal kind of a all greek city to it without being ponderous just it was it, on one level just a very easy read which almost bordered on chiclet on one le- weird level but you know i wouldn't i wouldn't like to use that term but i think it just traversed all these spaces beautifully and i really appreciate you writing it because um it's very it's very rare and difficult in to my mind especially i find if i may say so in south asian writing um to allow big issues to kind of like just um creep into the writing but without without being you know heavy hmm. so the heft comes through just by the storytelling in this which is what is really beautiful honestly um, you know for me the most important thing the most difficult thing for me was to give both saf and ruby agency in the book yeah you know i wanted to make them both rounded characters so that <clears throat> you didn't judge them from the outset yeah and that you felt some sympathy for both of them yeah 
it came and, true and i had i tried very hard to do that uh because otherwise it becomes a uh, one dimensional yeah and it's not an interesting read in order to be interesting you have to be invested in those people yeah and what they do and so that was a bit difficult because i um uh, i have um i do feel that there should be accountability for everybody you know uh um, so that was a, a a difficult call but at the same time what you said is is actually quite um uh, resonates for me because i um when i started i told you i started thinking about the um about harvey weinstein and how yeah. that ha- happened in pakistan and the first thing i thought when i was thinking of politics the first two people who came to my mind were clinton and monica lewinsky bill clinton and monica lewinsky and i thought to myself you know it it happened there like that you know and 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 as you said it could be anywhere any time you know i mean i just watched this um uh, this series on netflix about dominique strauss kahn mm. uh, it's incredible because it's it's um it's so complex you know that these men behave the way they do and then there's all these women who enable them in, in a strange way which i've never fully understood and in the in the book i think um you you see that less because his wife is a different story in this particular mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. but uh but that whole idea of of power connected with male um superiority entitlement and, and sexuality and is and male entitlement they they they're, they're feeling that they can do what they want to whom they want when they want yeah 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 and and to think that a girl who's educated come out of london blah blah you know continues to get ensnared is so mm. it's so sad and so plausible really mm. um and uh, so so I, i yeah i like that i mean i did think that saif was um a bit too manipulative sometimes like i almost wanted to see his vulnerability a little more perhaps vis-a-vis his wife etc which came through in bits yeah mm-hmm. uh, but you know i i uh, i think you're right there but i also believe that uh people after a certain time become impervious because there are so many yes men and women around them yeah you don't let them you know um they there is a real culture a courtier culture in our part of the world of course you know so that they don't allow that once a person becomes famous or once a person becomes a celebrity or once a person becomes whatever they uh, they are surrounded by all this this kind of coterie of people whose job it becomes thereafter to make nahi nahi sahab aap aap to aapki to baat aur hai aapke yeah. to you are different you know aapke bare mein to nahi kaha you know you are and and i remember um and and then it kind of turns your head perhaps i mean i did i i wasn't able to enter his head space but i was happy enough to be in rubies which was just very very charming and also namita i mean for me it was also about i wanted to the reason why the book begins with the sentence that it does yeah is because i grew up reading so many mills and boon uh, novels yes you know all these kind of romantic novels that girls head is stuffed with when they are young yes you know so they begin to believe that oh, absolutely that It's somebody who doesn't treat you well and little girls are told you know that if a boy is is sort of is mean to them at school or in a playground or whatever and she comes and says to her mother such and such a boy pushed me the mother is likely to say oh because he probably likes you you know and so girls are brought up to believe almost that and when you read these novels all of them are about a guy who treats them badly at first but then tells them he's loved them all along yeah and and so they believe that this idea that they have in their heads so for yeah. me i also had to channel that kind of bad boyfriend vibe through the book yeah you know, who is the bad boyfriend you know the guy who says he'll call you but doesn't doesn't keeps you hanging yeah. on the phone yeah you know um waiting to 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 hear from him yeah um uh, and and who lets you down and who tells you he's going to take you here and take you there and do this and do that and doesn't you yeah. know it keeps you sort of dangling that yeah. expectation 
yeah, won't let me go. It's the most common game played in between men and women. And I mean, it's unbelievable. And yeah. especially, especially when it's the, a twenty-three-year-old and she's completely starry-eyed. And the older guy, you know. Uh, but but what I was trying to say was that these are the expectations women have. These are the yeah. expectations that they are brought up with. Yeah. Uh, and and they, you know, they believe that they somehow or the other. This is love. This is sort of the way it should be. Who, according to you, were the really sort of redeeming characters in the book, and what what did they represent? Like for me. Farah, who uh, for our viewer viewers, I will just quickly tell them that she's the journalist who um, is the counter voice, uh, who kind of like. Um, she's Ruby's friend. She's Ruby's friend, and she's a journalist, and has this. It's Ruby's uh, conscience as well. She's almost Ruby's conscience, and she's also the country's conscience because she calls out um, the lies that this presidential candidate is. Um, thrusting on the public through all his nonsense tweets etc mm. and she's like you know she she says he's not he's not as noble as he makes out etc so i i like i was very intrigued by her character because i see more and more of that happening amidst all this you know you have yes. sort yes. of uh and and in pakistan as well i'm told you know like that there is this sort of younger more vo- vocal yeah. voice that often gets into trouble uh mm. So, female activists you know a lot of women activists and particularly um you know now that you know misogyny has become such a sort of uh, um powerful and and um virulent thing on social media so women have become more outspoken and so women have become more you know they 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 defend each other as well now yeah uh, you know and it aurat march is a very big thing in pakistan every year more and more young women come out and protest on the streets um yeah. they want their rights they want you know and and uh, farah is is for me the the moral center of the book yes you know she is the the moral backbone of the book yes and okay. uh, she i didn't want her to be a kind of goody two shoes heavy character you know yeah. and and kiran in her own way Yes, is also uh, uh, somebody who sees clearly. Yes, you know who who doesn't act but sees. Uh, Kiran bears witness. Uh, Farah is an activist. Yes, and I wanted to sort of bring out that distinction as well. But I wanted to talk about uh, uh, that th- there is hope. you know it's not I, it's not as bleak as it seems yeah and even the history teacher um, her yes. her history teacher had yes. that sort of quality so i like the fact that you brought in all these they and even the mother you know even nasibo even the mother they are women who keep it together you of know course, and course. and the mother wants her rights when that guy is is uh, yeah. uh, you know um abuses her the yeah. mother is aware of her rights she wants to fight but she can't yeah. you yeah. know um but what she does do is that she does keep it together she does get her daughter out she does try and get her daughter an opportunity yeah you know? um the history teacher is also somebody who who believes in your the your ability to change your life yes you know all those, these really really lovely like you know moments because they all gave you these different excursions away from the bad shit which yeah and also that you don't have to be a victim exactly you, know, you there is there there are options and yes they are hard and yes it's painful and yes it's it's it's, it's difficult but but there are options yeah and, so, so that's why it was just a lovely lens a sort of a small lovely lens for me into you know pakistan today it was very today mm. you know the, the the fact of the very contemporaneous of it was lovely and and really gave you a, a sense of how crazy and yet how hopeful things are all together at the same time you know um so you know my work has always um i've been very fortunate in that whatever i have written has found an audience in india um because um when i wrote the butterfly series a lot of people said to me this reminds us of us as well yes of course you know? um because it's about social observation and uh, my work is entirely about um social commentary yes. and when i was writing the butterfly series i was writing about uh, a character who's actually quite universal somebody who is Absolutely. very privileged uh lives in a bubble 
unaware of what else goes on around her, but is at the same time a witness to her times, you know. <clears throat> and I think it, it found um, a resonance in India because at the same people recognize that character there as well. Yes. And that whole society and, and, and the um, uh, entitlement of people who uh, exist in that sphere. Yeah. And the oblivion, um, the oblivion. And the oblivion, and the oblivion. Um, and so I think um, this book also, uh, so far, I mean, I've talked to you and I've talked to a couple of other people in, in um, uh, for literary events, etc. Um, and they too point out to me again, that this reminds them of India, that the political situation in the Absolutely. book reminds them of India, that the uh, social media phenomenon reminds them of India. The way women are targeted reminds them of India. And the Me Too, the Me Too part. And the Me Too. I mean, there's stories that I've heard exactly, you know, that, that mm. sound exactly like that from, from Yeah. Me. So I wanted to write a story which was not just cont about contemporary Pakistan, but about contemporary society. Yes. Uh, you know, I see, it in, I see it in the UK as well because I live here. And I see how people allow themselves to be misled. Yeah. You know, how people collude with their own um, with their own bamboozlement in a sense would you, know? you uh, would you say that something like what happened to her could happen to a young man as much in uh, but not not necessarily in the sexual context but the delusional yes yes yes, yeah. yes entirely entirely okay um, you know, for the uh, to be made to feel that you've been picked up and brought into the center that, that yes. feeling. Yes. It's just so uh, exciting. Yeah. It makes you feel like you are now finally it's so you know, it all plays on the sense of grievance, grievance and exclusion. Yeah. You feel that you've been excluded before and you're now at the center. Yeah. It gives you such a sense of power. Absolutely. You know, it turns your head um, in a way that makes you want to keep this to yourself and at the same time push everybody else out. Hmm. So moving away from the act, from the actual novel, but to the issues that are sort of um, dealt with in the novel, do you believe in the larger picture that Me Too has actually changed things? How much? What are your observations just as, um, as an observer, as a woman, as a mom, you know, out there? So I live, you know, in two places in Pakistan and in, in, in London. I live in London, but I visit Pakistan very regularly. Um, I know India only from my few visits, which unfortunately have, have come to a halt because I can no longer get a visa now. But um, I can, I think in, in the UK, certainly there's been a huge change. Yeah. Um, women, young women are much more aware. Younger men, I have two children. My son is 19, my daughter is 22. And both of them are extremely aware of the kind of language they use, of the kind of language other people use, of how you can and cannot um, behave and talk now in order to give respect to people. Um, and in the UK, I think there has been, um, I think work environment has changed enormously. It, of course, there's still a lot of misogyny. Of course, there is still a lot of inequality. Women don't get paid the same amount as men. Women don't have the same privileges as men do. Um, they don't get promoted in the way they do, uh, uh, you know, in the way men do. So, and you will have uh, um, the, the people who head organizations and corporations, etc inevitably are men but still change is coming um in the in pakistan also but you know patriarchy is so much more entrenched in pakistan um that it's it's difficult it's much harder to break and um i think uh, uh things are changing there as well but much more slowly yeah. much much more slowly um and it's going to be a more of an uphill battle there yeah. but the, things are changing i think um, and I think that um, there is hope. There is hope for all of us. Um, and my daughter, certainly, for example, I put up with a lot of stuff. And I'll say to her, for example, if you're walking down the street and somebody wolf whistles, I just say to her, ignore it, just carry on. And she says, no, why should I ignore it? And why should he feel that he can say this to me or do this to me? He can't. And she's much more um, combative than I am because I have learned to keep my mouth shut. 
Yeah. I have learned to avert my eyes and just carry on. Yeah. Um, she is much, much more, my niece is the same way, yeah. much more combative, much more aware, um, and therefore much more um, able to change things as well. Yeah, I can see that for sure. That's nice to hear. Hmm. Um, any of the other, any other issues that you want to talk about as far as the book and the writing of it and how long did it take? And The book took me about two, three years to write. Uh, okay. In between, I had sort of gaps, as I always do. I'm not the most... Yeah. I'm not the most uh, uh, organized and disciplined person in the world. <laughs> so uh, it took me a while. Uh, but once I got going, once I got a grip of Ruby, I yeah. was right. Um, and, you know, for me, Namita, the biggest thing was for I didn't know whether to write it in first person or whether to write it in the third person. I kept uh -huh. going back to first person and thinking maybe I should write it in first person. But then I wanted to see Ruby from her, uh, from the outside as well, how yeah. other people were seeing her. Yeah, I like um, that a lot because you get you, you got different points of view in the book, for sure. Um, so and that, that was important to me that she should. Yeah. Having said that, I did not want to do a complete omniscient third person uh, uh, narrative. So it is that sort of, you know, from her point of view entirely. Yes. That, so the book was seen... Well, you know, although it's in the third person, it's from her point of view. Yes. And, so and you, sorry, sorry, Gary. No, I was just going to say that the authenticity of her emotions and her trajectory are remarkable because it's very hard to get that right, I feel. And, you know, when you're not the person. Thank you. I really like that. It was just, she was a vulnerable but slightly annoying person. And it was just that. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. I felt like shaking her as well while I was I writing. Know, I know, really. <laughs> but um, thank you. So I'm going to jump off and leave um, sure. you to your question answers. Certainly. Ravi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank it's you. It's lovely to you as always. Thank you. Thank I'm you. And this book. May I pass it around? Okay. Yes. Sure. Uh, we're going to take questions from our audiences. We have a question from Parambir Bhatia. How do you get into the soul and mind of a 23-year-old girl? Did you survey a group of 23-year-old girls? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't survey 23-year-old girls, but I have a daughter who's 21, uh, who was 21 when I was writing the book, 20 and 21. She's now 22. Um, and I remember from my own childhood childhood I remember from my youth what I used to feel like I, I sort of reached back and I tried to think of, of how I felt at that time and what were my own insecurities and what were my big concerns at that time um, and because I'm a journalist as well I get to interact with people of different ages and from different classes um, and from different nationalities so I tried to to um, channel some of that into the work. I didn't do any surveys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next question is from Amar Kumar. Your books have been a fun mix of Hindi, Urdu, and English. Ruby sounds more like a serious social commentary around patriarchy. Uh, a pandemic-induced pivot? I started I'm writing it much before the pandemic. You know, the thing is that books take a year to be published. So I gave the book in, I think, uh, in August, September, September, September 19, uh, 2019. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the book, you know, um, before the pandemic, before I even knew that somebody had eaten a bat in Wuhan, this book had already been sent off to um, to India. No, it was just about how I was thinking along, you know, since 2016, I have been thinking about different things. And this book has, has allowed me to express myself. But it is funny. Um, it is just funny in a different way. It's, the humor is darker. Yeah. Um, well, this is not a question, it's um, uh, Megana uh, N who's asking for some advice. What do you think I should tell people who feel that misogyny, feminism, political correctness are all perspectives, in quotes? 
Well, um, I don't think they are just perspectives. I think if you were to look at the facts, if you were to look at the number of women, even in the West during pandemic who have been um, suffered gross domestic abuse, uh, I don't think you would call that a perspective. Um, the number of women who are killed in Pakistan for honor is not just a perspective. It is, it is a cold hard fact. Um, if you look at the number of women who are, uh, the number of girls who are sent to school as opposed to the number of boys who are sent to school, the number of women who head companies and political parties and uh, national and international organizations as opposed to men, you will find that there's a very big difference. And that too is, is, is a, a fact that can't really be argued with. Um, those are all facts, I think. They are not perspectives. Um, thank you for that, Moni. Um, we have no more, uh, uh, we have one more question. Uh, this question is from Neha Kumari. How should aspiring writers discover themselves? How important is discipline when it comes to writing? It is fundamental. It really is fundamental. You have to sit and write and, you know, stay with it. Uh, sometimes things happen, sometimes they don't happen. But the only way they will happen is if you sit down every day and write for a certain period of time. Um, and, you know, in the beginning, for me too, uh, I think for most writers, there are days when nothing comes. Um, and there are days when just whatever comes, the next day you look at it and you think this was rubbish and you get rid of it and you start anew. But, I, you know, everybody thinks that writing is should just come naturally. It doesn't, it's, it's a discipline and it's an art and it is also um, uh, a craft. You have to learn it and it's, you have to teach yourself it. Um, just like if I was to say to you that, make me a, 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 a pottery bowl, you couldn't do it the first time. You would have to work and learn and then you would be able to do it. Same with writing. Uh, there's a follow-up question from Amar Kumar. Um, you know, his question was about, uh, you know, social commentary and patriarchy. Um, is machismo uh, more of an Asian thing, in your opinion? Um, I, I, you know, it, it is alive and well in uh, Trump. I think uh, if you look at somebody like Donald Trump, he is he's very macho. Um, he believes in his own machismo. Um, if you look at somebody like Putin, he believes in his own uh, machismo. If you look at somebody like uh, Boris Johnson as well. Um, that said, patriarchy has uh, deeper roots, I think, in the continent. It takes, you know, uh, it, it will take more for us to uproot it here. Um, and... Uh, but the work is ongoing. Uh, that was the last question, Moni. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your social commentary on our times and saying it as it is about patriarch, patriarchy, machismo and the powerful. Uh, and thank you audiences for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Many thanks. <laughs>